Hello and welcome to this conference presented by Hogan Lovos. And the um, the topic will be on advancing mobility, a global view on opportunities and challenges for artificial intelligence and autonomous vehicles. The moderator for this session will be Mr. William Yevansky, who is the global co-head for automotive sector at Hogan Lobos. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for joining today. And thank you to Autonomy Digital for hosting this great event. Our Hogan Lovells team is very proud to contribute uh, to this and our, our other uh, panel sessions, which I think at this point you can retrieve on demand if you wish. If you wish. Um, as was mentioned, I'm Will Yavinsky. I'm a mergers and acquisitions partner based in our Washington DC office and the global co-head of our M&A group. I'm joined today by a cross-border uh, gathering of my partners and colleagues. Uh, first is Charlotte LaRue, who is a senior associate in our Hogan Lovells Paris office, who focuses her practice on commercial contracts and regulatory matters relating data and cybersecurity, mobility, transportation, and telecom, uh, as well as Sebastian Polly, who is a partner in uh, Hogan Lovells Munich office and with me, co-head of the global automotive industry sector at Hogan Lovells. Sebastian focuses on product liability, product safety, and product compliance law in his practice. And uh, lastly, but certainly not least, Liang Zhu, who's our partner in the Hogan Lovells Beijing office, a corporate partner as, as I am, who works closely with major Chinese and European automotive OEMs on their minority investments, JV, restructuring, and exit options in China. Um, and as well as other cross-border M&A and joint venture transactions for Western corporations doing business in China and Chinese enterprises looking to expand and invest in, in other markets. So to the next slide and, and to set the stage a bit as we get started. So, you know, as, as attendees will be aware, the automotive industry is no longer focused on the traditional vehicle. And not only are the vehicles changing, but we are now focused on mobility, i.e. different modes of travel for people and goods that are all connected in new and evolving ways. Developments in artificial intelligence and autonomous vehicles are playing a key role in the commercial, consumer, and industrial applications in this new mobility. And we think, and as is broadly seen, will have far-reaching effects on the automotive sector as a whole. And at the same same time, projected timelines to advance autonomous vehicles beyond the now familiar SAE level two applications like Tesla's autopilot have, have been delayed. For example, just to choose one, Gartner's hype cycle for connected vehicles and smart mobility published this last July showed autonomous vehicles in what they call the trough of disillusionment um, and a projected market delivery of even as long as 10 plus years. And so with, you know, with this background, several important considerations emerge that we're going to use to frame our, our discussion today. First, what are the political and legislative hurdles to developing AI and AV for the automotive sector and how can those be overcome? Second, what factors are driving development in autonomous vehicles in major markets such as the European Union, China, and the United States? And are there factors leading to competing development for electric vehicles as opposed to autonomous or within AV, uh, development in the commercial logistics area prioritized over consumer applications? And last, how can industry participants use strategic transactions to enhance market position in artificial intelligence and autonomous vehicles while still mitigating risk? But first, let's take a poll. We're asking here, and I believe you should receive a, a prompt within the autonomy platform as well, but we're asking in your view, which of the following markets is best positioned to lead in encouraging the successful development of autonomous vehicles and artificial intelligence in the automotive sector? Just a friendly reminder for our audience that you can go to the interactive discussion and there there is a tab called Sondage, which means questionnaire, and there you will see the question and we'll be able to respond there. Thank you.
Okay, we've had about a minute to, um, to, for, for folks to add their input if they wish. Um, we'll see if we have some results coming up for this, for this poll. Give us some perspective. And I appreciate, uh, for at least speaking from someone coming from the U.S. side, uh, too close or early to call is, is a familiar phrase that we're hearing these days with our with our presidential election. So, wouldn't be surprised if that's if that's an, an option people are, are 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 picking up on. Um, I am I'm not able to see the results were on on my end at this point, but I think just to give us a sense of sort of the state of the market as we're waiting for those results to come in. Leon, could you, uh, could you comment on the state of the market for AV in China these days? Thank you, Will. Um, China, is, uh, China is one of the largest market in terms of automotive uh, uh, industry. I, I think for many years, China has been the largest, actually the largest market for the automotive uh, uh, industry, both in terms of uh, sales and production. And I believe China is also the largest EV market in the world. Um, currently, Tesla is uh, probably the dominating uh, player in the EV market in China right, right now. But we are also seeing local brands such as the Neo, Xpeng, and Li Auto, which uh, you know, either recently go, went public on the Nasdaq or already have, has been on the up Nasdaq for a while. Each of them who is uh, billions or tens of billions uh, valuation, so they are very large companies now. And uh, talking about the AV sector, this is a strategic priority for China, and the Chinese government is pushing strongly for its development. It is estimated that China's AV market will reach uh, 1.5 million units by 2025, growing on a compound annual growth rate of 28%. Uh, for the time being, it's mainly about uh, AO1 and AO2, and we start to see some, some uh, AO3, AO3s uh, in the Chinese market uh, as well. And uh, last but not least, from a legal perspective, it is important to note that China is uh, very much encouraging foreign investment in the AV and AI markets. So there's uh, you know, no foreign ownership restrictions in this sector. Um, well, th thanks, Liang. And I'm, I'm glad we started with you because we're. it seems we've got a 44% uh, return rate saying China is the is the market best position from our audience's perspective. Um, really? So, so let's turn let's turn next to the to the EU to to Charlotte and Sebastian to hear your thoughts on uh, European Union and member states. Uh, well, in Europe, we also noticed an increasing number of partnership relating to AVs. Uh, for France, uh, I can say that autonomous vehicle and artificial intelligence uh, is also a strategic priority. For the government. I can also share a couple of figures to highlight this, not in terms of financial growth, but in terms of operational, operational development. Um, in France, since, since 2015, we have more than 100 authorization that was granted for autonomous driving vehicle testing regime. So this is quite a lot with, uh, it, it's just summarized the number of projects that we have on. France aims at to reach an accumulating uh, number of more than a million kilometers driven by AD by 2022, so uh, we're quite enthusiastic on that. And also in, in 2019, the French government has selected two consortia to lead 16 AD vehicle pilot across France. So the government has allocated 42 million in euro to finance this project. So we can see that the French government is really pretty involved in that. Maybe in addition to what, what Charles just said, for, for Europe, I think it's important to understand um, there are a lot of member states, and of course, a lot of things in Europe are harmonized. Um, of course, the type approval regime is harmonized, but uh, politics and how uh, member states want to drive and push and incentivize autonomous driving, AI, that can differ. And um, I think with, with Charles from France and, and myself from Germany, we have the two major markets covered for uh, this presentation. And I think it's, it's interesting to know that particularly those major markets um, are very much, of course, driving and pushing, and that there is even a certain competition amongst EU member states who is 
trying to position itself best and its OEMs and both France and Germany, but also, of course, countries like Spain, Italy, but now the UK that is about to leave the EU have strong manufacturers who, who all have their own agenda and, of course, a strong interest, um, both from a political but also from a corporate and business side to, to make sure that they are, they are very well positioned in, in this race for um, AI and AV leadership. So I'm pretty sure we can, we can see a very competitive European Union to, to achieve this goal. And from our perspective, that, that's a good thing. And Sebastian, I'm, I'm, thank you for raising you know, competition because I think that's going to be a continuing theme and sort of um, as, as, we, as we try to highlight some of the considerations that market players are going to face as they're, as they're moving into autonomous vehicles or if they're already operating there from the U.S. perspective, even with among the U.S. states, it, according to uh, the National Conference of State Legislatures, approximately 20 states plus the District of Columbia, where I sit, have enacted legislation related to autonomous vehicles. But we lack in the U.S. of a uniform federal re legislation that addressing autonomous driving um, and you know, the, the policy decisions for what will drive um, you know, priorities over the next four years have yet to come into focus, including because we're still awaiting the final uh, outcomes of the election in, uh, at the presidential level. But the U.S. remains home to you know, lead global leaders in, in the technology, such as Waymo, Argo AI, and others, and several major OEMs and industry players who are partnering with them. So as we'll talk about in this, um, in the, in, later in the presentation and the, the discussion, there is certainly a lot of movement in that, in that front. And uh, as we go into our next section on legislation and the politics of AV, you know, just this week, global leaders consisting of CEOs from the auto, tech, and logistics industries, as well as leaders from academia and the public sector, announced the formation of what they're calling the Commission on the Future of Mobility to, you know, as they say, identify opportunities across transportation and technology and propose a, a new vision for transportation policy for people and goods. But for policy to become law, it must necessarily be implemented by governmental authorities. And you know, as we've seen, results have been mixed. Charlotte and Sebastian, you know, any additional thoughts on how the EU and the member states are positioning themselves to have a legislative framework or otherwise a leading role when it comes to AI and AV? Yeah, as, as Sebastian raised it, the, in Europe, there is no one unique regulation will, which will regulate AI, AV. We have different layers, uh, which will either be uh, regulating at the EU level. So we have autonomous, for example, driving type approval, which will be um, regulated at the EU level, product liability with respect to AI, and other at the lo local level. That is not only the case for driving rules, transport regulation. So, uh, we are moving at different uh, stages on, on this, uh, but when we just speak about the EU level, uh, the European Union has, has, quite been, has been quite proactive with respect to the type approval regime, for example, because we have none at the international level. But on, on the EU side, we have implemented an exemption regime, uh, which will allow manufacturers to obtain for 36 months a type approval for driverless cars. So this is really one step forward. And we're looking forward to uh, other regulations on that. And maybe, and maybe what's worth adding is um, on a UN ECE level, um, which is also part of the type approval and where, where Europe is very strongly pushing things forward. Um, there are things happening on the, on the AV side. So there will be new rules um, that'll make it even easier and more harmonized. And also at the same time, because AV is, is closely tied to AI, um, there are certain initiatives from different um, EU Commission groups who, who try to, to push forward the AI landscape, particularly liability. Um, it's, it's sort of not a showstopper at the moment, but it kind of feels like the, the European Commission wants to first take care of, of the liability regime before granting their, their blessing for AI. So there has just been a white paper recently. Um, a lot of a lot of large companies also contributed. Hogan Lovells and our team was uh, was uh, privileged enough to to ghostwrite for some of these companies. And I think it's it's fair to say that that the Commission, of course, they they want to increase liability and force certain liability up on companies. 
um, which of course is a threatening concept. Uh, so for example, they are on the one hand, just to give a general idea of thinking about a kind of holder liability for AI. So if you are sort of uh, the holder of an AI, like you can be a holder of a car or the holder of a dog, um, you're strictly liable. So if your dog bites somebody, you'll have to pay. If your AI injures somebody, you might have to pay. At the same time, they're thinking about insurance schemes. So we're not there yet, but that's, that's clearly what they're suggesting in their white paper. So it's, again, it's a curse and a blessing, but this is the way we're, the direction we're moving at the moment. Mm -hmm. And if I, I can just add one last thing, just to put a timeline, and, and this is especially for France. Uh, France is proactive, as I said before, but uh, we have draft regulation that um, the government is working on. And uh, one of the timeline is uh, 2022. So we're expecting to have regulation on SAE level four uh, in France by 2022. Thank you both. And, and thinking about, um, you know, the, 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 the levels of which the, um, which legislation and policy are being developed. Liang, in China, is the legislation and policy encouraging autonomous vehicles similarly, similarly developed at a countrywide level, um, recognizing that China is in itself, you know, a market player, um, you know, larger in population size, but, you know, comparable to, to the uh, European Union as a whole? Um, not, I would say not exactly. At the national level, we actually do not have a lot of regulation uh, specifically targeting the AI or a AV industry. Um, things are more interesting at the local level. Uh, for example, Be both Beijing and Shanghai, they have local rules, which basically require that, that AV testing can only be conducted in designated areas and subject to a permit. So you need to have a license or a permit before you can do that. And in, in, in some areas, and also in Beijing, the companies who wants to do AI, AV testing actually are required to give access to the uh, monitoring devices, which are going to install on the autonomous driving vehicles. And both the device and the data collected by such devices would be accessible by the regulators. So this caused some concerns for you know companies, especially international companies, um, large OEMs, who are willing to testing AI in China. So this is the one concern from a regulatory perspective at the local level. Another thing you know on the local level is that uh, in many Chinese cities, China China is a huge company. So cities and you know provinces uh, sometimes they are competing with each other. They want to bring technology, bring. AV and AI to their jurisdictions. So if you if you come over to China and you team up with a Chinese partner, frequently your Chinese partner would probably you know get you talk to different local governments in you know across the number of Chinese cities because they are all eager to bring technology to their home and they are offering you know financial incentives for good technology, for good investment in their community. For example, we work with companies which are uh, coming from Germany and uh, they were able to get, uh, you know, a package of uh, incentives like uh, tax breaks, uh, you know, uh, rental free facilities, interest interest free loans. And sometimes uh, there, there, there could be out outright, you know, cash. So you are getting, basically you are getting free money from a local government as uh, incentives for you to build up your presence there and to develop, you know, your technology and creating, you know, local high quality jobs for the local community. So sometimes when foreign investors come over to China with uh, AI and AV technology, they could actually shop around, you know, different Chinese cities and try to get the best deal from a local government. Mm -hmm. This is something that we can, you know, people can remember when they come over to China. And it sounds, Liang, you know, that you've got, as you were mentioning as well, talking talking about sort of the monitoring devices and, and data data collection efforts um, that may be mandatory and, and depending on you know the the activities of the of the foreign company or really any company operating in the AV space in China. You know, I think it's important. Um, for this, you know, international group of attendees to think about, um, you know, China's approach to development, and you know, whereas you know, 
you know, the U.S. Take for example, the U.S. and China have been friends since the 1970s, but their friends don't always agree um, and may, may 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 fight because they see things from different vantages, um, including from a trade perspective. Um, you know, is this is the monitoring um, and data that's collected is that viewed at all by China as sort of if, as national security reasons to incur, to encourage the collection of that information or the location and maintenance of that information? Um, I, I imagine it, it can be, um, and you know the treatment of that sort of information as you know is protected under national concern, security concerns may lead other countries to respond by protecting their own homegrown technology. We've seen in the U.S. Uh, CFIUS mandatory declarations uh, relating to investment transactions concerning what, what, what are dubbed critical technologies um, requiring export controls um, or limiting access, for example, to China-based entities with a perceived state role like Huawei. Um, you know, I think I think we are we start we're starting to highlight how some of the uh, practical realities that commercial parties can face may have you know, broader effects, I think, in the, if you look at the cross-border politics of the de development of such an important technology. Um, and, you know, we can, we can return back to this, this topic shortly, I think, on the U.S. side. Um, certainly, you know, as mentioned at the top, there's been a, a bit of a freeze on federal legislation since the, you know, late I believe the latest was late 2017 for a federal bill providing a statutory framework for autonomous driving, um, which has been reintroduced, but is now, um, you know, so still in a holding pattern. But meanwhile, similar to how Charlotte was mentioning, you know, the numbers of AV testing permissions to be conducted. Um, I've seen it reported that California just as on its own has granted AV testing permissions to more than 65 companies um, with a large international component, more than, you know, more than half of those companies even being outside of the auto industry and nearly half being based outside the US and Europe and Asia. Um, you know, thinking about going back to this topic and, and going on to our next item on factors driving development, um, you know, thinking about competing to attract investment and development in autonomous vehicles. And of course, you know, all governments and markets are in the end competing to gain market share. Um, Leon, you know, assuming that there are neutral manufacturing and other logistics costs um, and taking into account some of the factors like Sebastian was mentioning on, on liability, might uh, companies exploring autonomous vehicles prefer to test those vehicles in China rather than in the EU or US based on you know, consumer attitudes to how that data is used and perhaps less litigation exposure? Yeah, well, the, the poll, our poll just to show that uh, most of the people on this uh, webinar are confident that China probably can, you know, uh, more likely to win this game in terms of uh, AV, technology development. I think uh, China has uh, do have uh, some advantages. Two things. Um, first, China has a population of 1.3 billion people, which is more than, you know, maybe US and Europe uh, combined. So this population is going to create an enormous amount of data, which is uh, good for purpose of, uh, you know, machine learning and the development of AI. And the second thing is that China has grown a culture whereby, you know, it's very in favor of uh, digital economy and artificial intelligence. Chinese consumers that they are willing to share their personal data for convenience in life. In, in life. This, uh, this is, uh, I, I think this is almost a fundamental, you know, culture point which presents a big advantage to the, to the development of uh, avian AI in China. People are less sensitive when it comes to sharing their personal data. So it is easier to conduct a testing and accumulate data in relation to the AV development. Uh, one example would be, you know, in, as, as a part of uh, you know, people's uh, everyday life, you have to use a lot of apps 
uh, social media, you know, like uh, WeChat. And every every time you log on to a new service, you would see a set of uh, standard privacy policy and the terms and conditions requiring consent from uh, people. And the Chinese people, they are very used to that type of things. And everybody, almost everybody, including myself, would not read all these terms. So just cl click on yes and get into the access as soon as possible. So this is almost a part of a culture. We don't know this would be what that means for personal freedom or, you know, um, personal rights in relation to data, personal data, um, privacy uh, rights. But as a business, uh, you know, phenomenon, this is a really good for development of the technology. Um, in terms of, uh, well, you may mention that uh, about the litigation and product product liability here in China. I think China is not a country, you know, people like in the U.S. People you know, want to sue, you know, based on every single small claims. This is not the way China or Chinese people run their uh, their life or Chinese companies that run their business. So in terms of litigation risks and the cost of litigation, so even if you lose the cases, we do not see a lot of uh, punitive damages in this country. So that is a, a, a you know, significantly smaller part of the cost if you compare to uh, EU and uh, US in terms of uh, AV testing in China. And I think this kind of continuing on the point of, of liability and thinking about sort of some of the choices that uh, that market participants are going to be making uh, Sebastian you know when you, when you're coming at this from your from product safety and liability regime perspectives um, you know are those painting a different or more complex picture in Europe and also turning to one of the questions we've gotten in the q a you know is this is, is the product safety and liability considerations influence the, um, you know, the development of AVs for the delivery of goods as opposed, or commercial industrial uses, as opposed to, you know, use in moving people uh, from, a, from a legal perspective and sort of motivating development at, the sta at these stages? Thank you, Will. Yeah, that, that is absolutely right. So, I mean, Europe, um, is very much driven by liability and safety and not, not just by, by civil liability. I mean, good news in Europe is, is as most of you probably know, there are no such things as, as punitive damages, no, no juries in most, most member states. But of course, we have in a lot of member states very, very strong criminal product liability provisions. So, I mean, once it's, it's, it's legitimate, once it's approvable from a regulatory perspective, companies could go to market. And um, like Charlotte al already said, I mean, a lot of member states, such as France, but also Germany, in pretty much every member state, you can test by now. You can, going back to the Q&A question, you can test both on highways, autobahns. To some degrees, you can test in cities. It's just a question of who's competent, what is, what is legal, um, what do you need to, to get the exceptional approvals. But long story short, I mean, if you kill somebody, it's not just so much about do you have a lot of money and can you pay people off, but it's a lot about the brand, the protection of the company as a whole, its credibility, but also its staff, its members, the decision makers from a criminal law perspective. And um, just theoretically, I mean, so far, as you know, some OEMs already had fatality cases with their... Um, depending on the exact level, there are also some discussion that they had some fatalities already during testing, during a field operation, um, without saying names, I think, think we all know these cases. But on the other hand, I mean, one has to be extremely careful. So you can do a lot in Europe, but you should have a certain layer of certainty, particularly a paper trail that protects you, particularly criminal liability. In the end, people will ask the question, was this negligent or not? And it does not make so much a difference whether it was testing or it was actual field or series operation. Um, the question will always be, was it negligence to, negligent to place this, this vehicle on the market? So you need to have strong defenses there. And um, to, your, to your other part of the questions, uh, what about goods and services versus people? What's about commercial versus private? I mean, of course, um, when you aim at, at goods and you aim at professionals, I mean, it's a different thing whether your target group is a truck driver who's operating for a fleet manager, which is a completely business-oriented streamlined operation, or if you aim at your average consumer 
and and you might end up with the with the elderly lady who is is maybe who maybe requires a completely different level of protection. But even if we aim at professionals and goods, I mean, it's it's not just the people in the car, the driver, the passenger. I mean, it's also the bystanders, and and those are typically those examples where we really talk about the innocent bystanders who were not asked whether they want to put themselves in AV or not. They're just you know, they're just out there. And um, I think from a European perspective, it is all workable, it is manageable, but you're definitely right. Those are, those are the drivers and the questions that we need to ask ourselves. And that's, and that's focusing a lot on the physical, um, you know, risks to, to, you know, to, you were talking about the various capabilities of the drivers. I'd also think sort of the, the damage exposure from a data security and, and data privacy perspective is also some, an item driving driving the development in, in Europe. Charlotte, you know, from your perspective, as we're thinking about, you know, I've seen another comment about vehicle to everything uh, technology and sort of the, you know, the, the connected cars uh, element of AV that would be necessary to have them run. Um, you know, how are you seeing, um, you know, data ownership and privacy considerations in, in Europe influencing, um, you know, progress in this space? Uh, first, concerning data ownership, um, there is no such legal concept, especially when data is personal. Um, however, it is possible to reach the so-called data ownership rights by different uh, other measures, which would protect legally and physically the data. Um, and also all the analysis that will derive from the, the raw data. For example, through contractual measures, including business secrecy, with also intellectual property rights when applicable and also technical measures such as encryption. So all these different measures will give a sum of ownership right to an entity. So this is really key to consider all these contractual uh, um, arrangements and have that in mind. So we noticed that entities are paying now more attention to this topic and this is reflected under their contractual arrangements. Then. Concerning privacy consideration, uh, if autonomous collect personal data, the obligation imposed on the collection of such data are mainly the same as in any other sector, which is slightly different because it's another sector, but when you collect personal data, you cannot use them without complying with data privacy rules, such as GDPR, and also other guidelines implemented by Data Protection Authority. So I won't go into that because everyone heard about GDPR so many times, uh, but, uh, because I said that I think that protection of personal data is a hot current and very well-known topic. But another uh, hot topic, in my opinion, which I find crucial today, is the regulatory framework which will govern uh, and is governing data sharing uh, for all the data collected by connected cars and now autonomous cars. Um, car manufacturer, uh, and I'm speaking for Europe, car manufacturer and equipment manufacturer are legally obliged to share data with other entities, either public or private, either with their partners or with competitors. This is the case with the VIN number, with the data collected through the CITS stations, with e-call, the even data recorders, and also other recorders. So it's really crucial to follow the upcoming regulation on data sharing because uh, data is key for entities and, and we just want to have an eye on what's going on with this sharing. And the last and not least, well, most crucial consideration is regarding cybersecurity regime that will apply to autonomous vehicle. Uh, in Europe at this stage, we have the GDPR, which establishes a number of requirements in terms of security measures, which are not enough specific to autonomous, autonomous vehicles and are not as well done as in the US. And we also have uh, a NIST directive, uh, which is for uh, crucial networks and which relate to operators of essential services and does not really cover autonomous vehicles as, as such. They, more they will more cover uh, transport, uh, uh, crucial transport services. Uh, we are therefore waiting for a new legal regime, uh, which could, in our opinion, really derive from the NIST directive with more stringent obligations on uh, the car manufacturer, but also on manufacturer of in-vehicle uh, equipment, including ABS, to be followed. <laughs> Thank you, Charlotte. Yes, there's certainly, this is a, certainly a watch this space uh, topic. And I, I do want to make sure 
um, maybe a little selfishly as a deal lawyer and I, as, as Liang is as well, um, shift uh, to our final topic on strategic transactions. And you know, when you're looking at um, a, an, an area of investment where you know, McKinsey tracked investments totaling more than $40 billion in the last 10 years in the areas of AV sensors, ADAS components, and you know, AV software and mapping, and billions of dollars of average annual investment in those areas, um, you know, we're, we're seeing um, investments and partnerships announced, it seems almost daily. I think you know, many of us saw in the last 48 hours, Daimler Trucks uh, and, and, and its uh, affiliate Torque Robotics entering into a collaboration agreement with Luminar with regard to LiDAR technology, um, Triton uh, in, in announcing a few weeks ago, it's investment and cooperation uh, efforts with China-based uh, long-haul trucking startup in autonomy, uh, Too Simple. That's a transaction on which Liang and I advise Triton. Um, and you know, the acquisition of Zooks by Amazon earlier this, earlier this year. Um, you know, Liang, as, as we see um, these sorts of cooperation efforts and spreading the, spreading the risk, or maybe even a fear of missing out, uh, among established market players and new entrants. Um, is cooperation across markets also common in China um, as you're seeing it? And are there particular examples of deals in this space briefly where, um, you know, that, where we're seeing which market participants may be winning uh, so far? Yes, I, I think this topic is uh, consistent in, uh, in China as well. I think every single major Chinese OEM, they have uh, almost every everybody has a corporate venture fund, and they 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 are looking they are looking for and they invest you know in automotive or in AV startups uh, all the time on a regular basis. Uh, and speaking for myself, I work with a major Chinese OEM. Uh, for a number of years, and uh, their corporate development team, they would always, uh, you know, come to us uh, uh, with a number of uh, such targets on the or, or investments on a yearly basis. So we have seen a lot of uh, um, these movements uh, in China, uh, uh, from investments from OEMs and to to startups, and in terms of. Uh, um, the startups, uh, the, the famous ones would include uh, um, Pony AI, which is backed by Toyota, Baidu Apollo, um, V-Ride, which is backed by Nissan, Renault, and Mitsubishi. And uh, I think this year, the biggest deal is probably from a uh, uh, 500 million US dollar investment from SoftBank into DD Autonomous Driving. DD is basically the Chinese version of Uber. So, you know, we are seeing quite a few uh, transactions on a, on a yearly basis. Um, and this is a consistent uh, from uh, OEMs to the startups. So, so yes, we are seeing a lot of uh, cooperations here in China as well. Mm -hmm. um, I know we just have about one minute remaining and I'd like to give the last word to, you know, a question from, from the audience. So we're seeing a question just came across that, you know, is there a chance that OEMs fully integrate AV startups um, such as, you know, Cruise under GM um, or, or that business model? Um, or is that, you know, are these business models and capabilities too different to perform such integration? Um, you know, I think, it's, I think it's too soon, a little bit too soon to tell. I think some of the collaboration we've seen looking at, for example, Argo AI, um, in as drawing investment from both Ford and Volkswagen, which are separately looking to uh, create, um, you know, collaboration and commercial partnership um, in other areas, is a good example of how um, you know automakers are trying to bridge that gap to sort of you know share the uh, share the development work while also um, while while also moving forward in this space. But I think this is a, this is part of the reason why new you know. Uh, adjacent entrants such as Amazon who bring industrial expertise um, and enter this space, you know, are not cut are not shut out because uh, they are able to, um, you know, have similar partnerships and build into some of the infrastructure that the OEMs, um, you know, were traditionally occupying all on their own. Um, Thank thanks, you so everyone. Much.
Yes, yes. For, I will. Yes. I will leave it there, but um, appreciate the question and engagement. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. And um, it was a really interesting discussion. And for our audience, um, please stay connected in, and on Autonomy Digital Platform for the rest of the program. And our speakers can go onto the platform and answer the questions there to, um, to our audience. And um, you are also uh, welcome to connect with each other to uh, further follow up on these topics. Thank you so much. And the live will be ended here.